to If Guitars Could Speak, the mini documentary series where we usually examine one famous guitar from history. But today, though, we have a very special video in store for you. Instead of looking at one guitar, we're going to look at one guitarist and his journey through the 60s British blues rock scene. This is going to be a retrospective of every single band of which Eric Clapton was a member of from the age of 16 until he officially went solo in 1970. Believe it or not, there are many bands in here that even I didn't know about before I wrote this video. This is going to be a long, strange trip, so grab a drink, maybe two, and get ready to follow the amazing career of the guitarist known as Slow Hand. And remember, if you like content like this, please consider hitting the thumbs up button down below and subscribing to the Guitar Historian channel to see more content like this. And now, all his bands, Eric Clapton, 1962 to 1970. Eric Clapton was born in Surrey, England on March 30th, 1945. His mother was only 16 years old and his father was a Canadian soldier who went to war prior to Eric's birth and then returned to Canada. Clapton actually grew up believing his grandparents were his parents and his mother was a much older sister. Eventually, his mother would marry another Canadian soldier and move to Germany, leaving young Eric with his grandparents. His grandparents did their best to foster Eric's love of music and bought him a Hoyer acoustic guitar for his 13th birthday. The guitar was hard to play though, and Eric eventually gave it up for a couple of years before picking it back up when he was 15. This is when Eric's love of the blues started to take shape. He became obsessed with finding the perfect blues tone, playing along with records for hours and hours, listening back to his playing on a portable reel-to-reel until they were just right. This constant hard work meant that by the time he was 16, Clapton was already one of the most advanced guitarists around. His first experience playing in front of people would come in 1962, when Clapton began busking the Kingston, Richmond, and West End of London, joining up with a fellow blues enthusiast named David Brock. They would play pubs around Surrey, and it wouldn't be long until Clapton would join his first real band, an R&B outfit called The Roosters. The Roosters' other guitarist was Tom McGinnis, who would go on to play long stints in Man for Man and the Blues Band as both a guitarist and a bass player. Clapton would stay in The Roosters for about seven months, moving on to fill in on a short stint with another band called Casey Jones and the Engineers. Throughout 1963, concurrent with Clapton's work, another band was toiling away on the blues rock circuit of the London area. The Yardbirds had succeeded the Rolling Stones at the Marquee Club as the house band and were looking for a new lead guitarist after Top Topham had left the group. Although the Yardbirds were firmly based in American blues, they had enough of their own signature style to stand out from the crowd. They developed a rave-up style of instrumental breaks where the band and the fans would go crazy and pushed the sonic experience of rock music further than many other bands of the period. Clapton was joining an already established blues band and he was ecstatic to tour with American blues man Sonny Boy Williamson in 1963. Clapton acquired the nickname Slow Hand during his stint in the Yardbirds from the band's manager, Giorgio Galmeschi. Apparently, whenever Clapton would break a string, he would stop and change it right then and there. The audience would initiate a slow hand clap to pass the time, and Gomelski used the term slow hand in reference to this. So, not the reason you might think, right? Clapton stayed with the Yardbirds all the way through 1964, capping the year off with his first appearance at London's Royal Albert Hall, a venue he would go on to play over 200 times. He would say of the Royal Albert, playing there is like playing in my front room. In March of 1965, the Yardbirds released For Your Love, a song that they had to talk Clapton into doing. When the song became a minor hit, the band decided to go in a more pop rock direction. That signaled the perfect time for Clapton's exit from the band. The Yardbirds would be okay though. They would enlist the help of Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page over the next few years. But that's a story for another time. A month later, Clapton would join up with John Mayall's Blues Breakers a band that became known as an incubator of some of the best musicians England had to offer. Jack Bruce, Peter Green, Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, Mick Taylor, and Ainsley Dunbar 
or just a few of the names passed through Mayall's outfit. Eric ended up playing a couple gigs, but he would quit a few months later in June. Just a short time later, Clapton was called up by fellow guitarist Jimmy Page to come over to his house to jam. The pair recorded several loose acoustic blues numbers without vocals, and Clapton left the jam session without thinking anything more of it. Little did Clapton know that behind the scenes, immediate records had heard about the sessions, and they approached Page and demanded that he clean up the recordings and overdub full band to create fully formed songs. They saw a potential gold mine in songs recorded by an already legendary Eric Clapton. Page, being signed to Immediate Records, faced the choice of finishing the recordings or losing his job. So Page enlisted the help of Rolling Stone's Mick Jagger, Charlie Watts, Bill Wyman, and Ian Stewart later in August to finish the recordings. The release of these recordings on Immediate Records became a sticking point of contention between Clapton and Page, with Eric feeling that Page had stolen his services without telling him. Unfortunately, the two men's relationship would remain strained for many years to follow. Later on that year, Eric would rejoin John Mayall's Blues Breakers. During his second turn with the Blues Breakers, the band would record the legendary Beano album, so named because Eric was pictured on the cover reading the comic called Beano. The album was credited to the Blues Breakers, John Mayall, featuring Eric Clapton. Clapton's surly tone on this record is the stuff of legend. Achieved by cranking his 1960 Gibson Les Paul standard through a Marshall amp as loud as it can go. His playing on the album would so excite one anonymous Londoner that they would go out and spray paint Clapton is God on a garage door. The album wouldn't be released until after Clapton had left the Blues Breakers for good in July of 1966. At some point before this departure, however, he collaborated with two names that would show up in his future, Jack Bruce and Steve Winwood, on a short-lived project called Eric Clapton and the Powerhouse. The Powerhouse was put together hastily as a means to promote a new London office for Electra Records, and consisted of Clapton, Bruce on bass, and Winwood and Pete York from the Spencer Davis Group. Man for Man singer Paul Jones would also lend harmonica to the songs. Ben Palmer, who went back to Clapton's Rooster Days, would play piano. Three songs would be released from these sessions on an electric compilation album called What's Shaken later in 1966. Clapton's next band, though, would make him an international superstar. In July of 1966, drummer Ginger Baker invited Eric to join Cream with bassist Jack Bruce. The band's history is already well documented. They would go on to record many monster hits and become one of the biggest box office draws of the late 60s. But the most important thing about Cream was how the band both pushed Clapton's playing and stage presence to the next level and also left him reeling psychologically as Baker's and Bruce's egos constantly clashed in fierce and brutal arguments. Both of these would have lasting effects on Clapton's playing and psyche for years, perhaps decades to come. It was around this time that a massive sea change shift in Clapton's tone and virtuosity would come in the unspoken rivalry between himself and American newcomer Jimi Hendrix, who would use the guitar in ways that no one had ever seen before. Hendrix's use of pedals, effects, and feedback changed the landscape of rock music forever, and his arrival in England in early 1967 was a seminal moment as nearly every major UK recording artist, from Pete Townsend to George Harrison to Keith Richards, ran to clubs to get a look at what Hendrix was doing. The Jimi Hendrix experience and Cream would vie for the title of England's most exciting act for several years. Clapton's stage presence and singing grew by leaps and bounds during this time as Cream set up as a power trio left him nowhere to hide on stage. Carlos Santana saw the band on tour in 1967 and said in his book that, quote, they looked like giants, like they were on stilts or something. In 1968, Clapton would collaborate on one song that would land him a temporary role in the biggest band in the universe. George Harrison asked Eric to play on While My Guitar Gently Weeps, as he felt the band wasn't taking the song too seriously. Clapton would use a 1957 Gibson Les Paul standard refinished in red they had given to Harrison earlier that year. But for more on that, 
Click the link above. His stint in the Beatles lasted only one day and went uncredited on the White Album. Clapton always felt constrained by too many labels. He felt that Cream was becoming hamstrung and was veering away from their blues beginnings. And so the decision was made for the musicians to go their separate ways after releasing their final album, Goodbye, in February of 1969. The toxic working relationship between Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce didn't help matters either. Clapton was often moved to tears by the arguments the men would have. At the end, Clapton was glad to be free of them. After Cream's dissolution, Clapton would play in the temporary supergroup that John Lennon had assembled for the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. The Dirty Mac consisted of Lennon on rhythm guitar and vocals, Clapton on lead guitar, Keith Richards on bass, and Mitch Mitchell of the Jimi Hendrix Experience on drums. The group would play two songs for the circus, which was slated to be released as a musical fantasy piece that had been dreamed up by Mick Jagger. The band played a version of John's White Album track, Your Blues, and a blues jam called Whole Lotta Yoko, with violinist Ivory Gitlis and Yoko herself lending um, something like vocals to the performance. The circus wouldn't see the light of day for decades, however, as Jagger and the Stones thought they'd been outplayed by the other bands, especially The Who, and it remained shelved until it was released in 1996. In early 1969, Clapton would again see himself dragged into another supergroup. Early that year, Clapton started to informally jam with Steve Winwood, following the breakups of Cream and an early form of Winwood's traffic. The jam session started to morph into a band concept, but Clapton was mortified to see his old bandmate Ginger Baker show up to play drums for the group. For some reason known only to Eric though, he stayed and the band added bass player Rick Gretsch to form Blind Faith. They would record one short album which spawned a tour of Scandinavia and the US but the band didn't have enough material and often played old cream and traffic numbers, which the audience loved, but the band wasn't quite as happy about it. Supporting Blind Faith on the tour was a little known American singer songwriting duo Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett. Their band, Delaney and Bonnie and Friends, would feature some truly towering figures of rock Dwayne Allman, George Harrison, Dave Mason, Leon Russell, Bobby Whitlock, and Clapton would all support the duo during various times. Clapton was drawn to the simple nature of the Bramlett's music, and he ended up spending more time with them than with Blind Faith in between shows. This led to tensions that broke Blind Faith up by August of 1969. This would begin a time of Clapton nearly becoming a journeyman guitarist for hire, and he would pop in and out of various projects over the next few months. Clapton would actually tour as a sideman into Delaney and Bonnie for a short time. He would also lend his guitar talents to John Lennon again when he played lead guitar on John's second solo single, Cold Turkey. There were a number of other very short collaborations and stints in various bands and recording artists during this time, including Ringo Starr, Dave Mason, Dr. John, Phil and Leon Russell. He also recorded with one of his idols, Hal and Wolf, and a superstar group of backing musicians like members of the Stones, Steve Winwood, and Ringo Starr. But the album failed to make a critical impact. Clapton would use members of the Bramlett's backing band to record his first solo album, Eric Clapton, which was released in the spring of 1970. Delaney Bramlett was especially encouraging of Eric to develop his singing and songwriting ability, and this culminated in a strong freshman effort from the road-weary guitarist, even surprising the American market with the hit After Midnight. Clapton was beginning to feel constrained again, but this time it was by his own legendary status. He had been influenced by the release of the band's 1968 album, Music from Big Pink, which dropped much of the pretentious guitar solos and long-winded instrumentation for simpler, more approachable sing-along style of a bygone era. It took him several years to act on his impulses, however, and his last major group effort in 1970 would be a memorable one. All the members that would eventually become Derek and the Dominoes were helping George Harrison to record his massive first solo effort, All Things Must Pass. The name was a play on a friend's nickname for Eric, which was Dell, and was originally slated to be Dell and the Dynamos. But this was misread as Dominoes, and then the name of Dell and Eric were combined to make Derek. This was Eric's attempt to distance himself from his own fame. It was also around this time that Clapton was in heavy pursuit of George Harrison's wife, Patty Boyd. And for more on that, check out this video above. But this affair would spawn two raucous love songs, Bell Bottom Blues and Layla. Today, the album Layla is often viewed as Clapton's best work. 
but at the time it didn't gain much traction on the charts. It wouldn't be until 1972 that Layla would receive widespread acclaim as one of the greatest rock songs of all time. The song also showcased a new collaborator, Dwayne Allman, who wrote the song's signature intro riff. Clapton would go on to call Allman like the musical brother I never had, but wished I did. The Dominoes would try their hand at a second album, but egos started to clash and Eric would leave the group disbanding it. It would be the last time Eric would officially be part of a named band for a project or tour. Eric Clapton's many collaborations and contributions to other artists' recordings is well known. Eric can always be seen playing tribute shows, relief concerts, and has done countless interviews about his fellow friends and musicians over the years. It has been our pleasure to listen to Eric Clapton's guitar work, and we are truly lucky to have an artist that is so open about his past successes and failures to inspire new generations of musicians to this very day. We hope you enjoyed this long, strange trip as we looked into all of Eric Clapton's bands. Please give this video a thumbs up down below and consider subscribing to the channel for more awesome content like this. We will see you next time on The Guitar Historian.